Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's sessions, where we'll be talking about the techniques that attackers are using to manipulate your employees and how we can stop them. In the last six months, we've seen an increase in phishing and advanced impersonation attacks. These attacks were already increasing before the global pandemic, and this trend is going to continue. But what I'm finding particularly interesting is the thing that's changing is actually the techniques that the attackers are using to manipulate our employees, trying to take advantage of this new working uh, situation, this new environment with everybody working from home. So why should we care? Why should we be worried about these types of emails? Well, today, I'm delighted to be joined by Jeff Hancock, a professor at Stanford University and an expert in trust and disinformation online and Dave Kennedy, an ethical hacker at Trusted Sec, who can bring us a little bit closer to the mindset of these attackers. So Jeff, I'm gonna start with you. Now that everybody is working from home, does this make people easier to manipulate and trick them? Well, unfortunately, the answer is yes. And as your statistics have shown, uh, when we change environments as radically as we have with the pandemic, moving from work situations to home, we see people in new uh, kind of thinking and mindsets. The idea there is that when we're at work, we enter into a psychological space where we know what's safe and what's not, and attacks are more difficult. When we disrupt that, people, they don't get dumber, but they're adjusting to that new environment. And it takes a little while to do that. We've all had that experience where we go traveling, and when we travel, we seem to lose a few IQ points. And that's because some of our cognition resides in our environment. And so attackers are taking advantage of that. One way, for example, is with uh, attacks coming from our networks. They seem to be people that we know. And now that we're in this new environment where there's a lot of uncertainty, um, those attacks are more effective. I also liked your other point. Security is really based around core psychological principles. And they've been with us for thousands of years. So greed and fear and wanting to help somebody else. Those are the things that scammers have been using since the beginning of human history. But now we're seeing them in, in new guises and new attack vectors once we're uh, in this new sort of working environment. Thanks for that, Jeff. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting you pull up the point about environment and you know everybody is working from very different environments to where they were six months ago. I wonder if you could just go a little bit deeper on kind of the changes environment and what that might do to the, I guess, the human psyche. I, you know, one example that we keep hearing from our customers is you're not sat next to somebody. You have maybe received an, uh, an, a strange looking fishy email. You might just lean across to your um, colleague and say, did you send me this? You know, that kind of proximity has gone. I wonder if there are any other things you can point to about why the change of environment does affect the human psyche so much. Yeah, it's um, a great example. So our intelligence doesn't just reside in our brain. It's uh, not only in the environment where I look around, I'm like, okay, I'm at work. This is the sort of mode that I'm in and I can think about what I am doing and also that I might have some things I need to be thinking about and be aware of. But exactly as you say, I have my colleague that's just sitting over there that I can check in with really fast, really lightweight, nothing official. I don't have to log you know, a concern or, uh, or reveal something that I've done. I can just ask. And so those are two really good examples. But the other idea is these ideas of uh, places. So most of the time, people have three places, their home, their work, and then a third place where they have fun. So in the UK, that'd be the pub. Here in the US, that might be you know going to play some sports or something like that. When we combine two places into one, that is difficult psychologically. And it's not that we're going to forever be uh, uh, in trouble, but as we adjust, we're kind of combining those two places and all the ways we think into that one space. So now I'm sitting in my home office, or maybe I'm at my coffee table, or even in my bedroom, where I don't have any of the cues and signals to think about threats and security. And I don't have my colleague to just quickly ask a, a question about. So it's a huge disruption. In addition to the fact that we're working at home for a really key reason, the whole world is dealing with this pandemic. And so now there's also a lot of attention being paid to that with a lot of uncertainty. So that also makes me more vulnerable to attacks that have focused on that. And we've seen huge increase on um, uh, pandemic-related uh, vectors. 
Great, thanks for that, Jeff. I've never heard it articulated with uh, home, work, and, um, and and pub before, and I'd argue that maybe some Brits have also combined all three actually during during the pandemic. Um, but uh, interestingly, you know, Dave, I think you can bring this kind of whole other perspective to the conversation, which we've had Jeff talk about the human psyche, changing environments. You know, people are uncertain; they can't lean across. Is, is this kind of music to an attacker's ears? How, what are they thinking and how are they changing their techniques, given everything that's going on, to try and make their phishing impersonation uh, attacks more successful? Yeah, what's, what's interesting is, you know, when, when you have an education awareness program or you work in an organization, you get used to a baseline. And that baseline is, is what you expect in your day-to-day -day normal you know, behavior from a, when you go into work at 9 o'clock to when you leave at 5 with work from home, you know, the, the demographics really changed quite a bit and the, there's a new baseline and that baseline is, is very substantially unknown. So you, you have attackers that are taking that and saying, okay, well, we have a new baseline where we can probably get in with a lot of easier um, type techniques um, against an organization because now they're working from home, they have less security requirements in place. And so we saw it very initially uh, when COVID first, first came out and, and, you know, the economies were shut down across the world. We saw a lot of commodity attacks um, become very successful. Um, but at the same time, they are working on much more advanced attacks, uh, increasing their sophistication levels, uh, ransomware groups, you know, retooled and, and started focusing on more uh, post-exploitation scenarios around organizations, um, you know, once they got access to an individual that was working from home. And so the, the techniques themselves changed very drastically uh, from a lot of the different ransomware organizations that we saw in nation states, um, you know, from, from a China, North Korea, Russia perspective, uh, Iran. And so, so everything really kind of shifted more towards the work from home workforce because there was a brand new baseline that they didn't typically have before. They weren't fight, fighting the perimeter firewalls anymore. They weren't fight, uh, uh, fighting uh, web content filtering. Um, they had a lot of these things that were, were essentially removed uh, in order to accommodate work from home. And it made it a lot easier for them to, to go after targets and individuals. And, uh, you know, I think as organizations continue to expand, you know, there definitely needs to be discussion on, on how do you balance work from home security uh, to ensure that you have equal or greater than security controls um, in those individuals to help protect against that, but also a whole discussion around education and awareness around what your baseline is uh, working from home. Uh, there was a dark reading article that 99% of the companies that that uh, went to work from home had no additional education awareness training, and people didn't even know how to get onto the VPN uh, onto their VPNs. So there, there was no additional education awareness around what was accepted, what wasn't. You know, again, we saw a lot of the commodity ones where you saw like, you know, hey. You know, click here to get your your stimulus package check. You know, your your PPP uh, checks for for you know funding for your business. You know, we saw a lot of those commodity attacks. But what also really changed is just going after people, saying, "Hey, based on you know uh, uh, us having to work from home, here's our new privacy policy for information they're able to view. People would click on it, compromise their 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 credentials, and then from there move uh, across other systems. So you know, attackers definitely take that into consideration, and they definitely focus on that um, in, in world events. Uh, one last thing I'll, I'll leave with. It was one of the very first cases that we saw um, of leveraging real world events uh, for social engineering was actually when Patrick Swayze uh, passed away from cancer. Uh, it, they, did, they did Google polluting at the time. This is years and years and years ago. And if you Google Patrick Swayze's death, the first result um, up there would actually deliver malware to your computer. And, you know, you know, and it was it was highly successful campaign, you know, infected, you know, tens of thousands of machines almost instantaneously before Google actually uh, took it down. And, you know, that, that type of heightened sense around uh, pandemic issues hot button topics, you know, um, during the Iranian situation recently uh, where Soleimani was 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 killed. Uh, that was a, a big hot topic uh, button press item for for uh, uh, cyber attacks with Iran as being a major issue that, that attackers focused on. So they will use that type of information very quickly uh, to spin into something that they can gain trust and gain access to your systems. Yeah, so I guess one of the takeaways there is that attackers have been uh, kind of taking advantage of world events long before um, COVID-19. And it's no surprise that um, when it came along that attackers were going to were going to jump on the on the opportunity. It's interesting that you kind of highlighted the example of um, you know PPE. We internally at Tessie and have, have seen those attacks. And I think another type of attack that we've seen that seems to be trying to take example um, advantage of the fact that people are working remote is impersonating software vendors who are trying to enable this um, remote workforce. So a lot of impersonations of famous video conferencing software, VPNs, etc. The attackers seem to have cottoned on to the fact that, you know, 
companies are sending their employees so many emails saying you need to download this new agent, you need to uh, sign up to this new service, that of course the, the attackers are going to start gravitating um, that way. Dave, if I could, if I could uh, stay with you, I'd love to hear um, about techniques um, that attackers use to try and kind of build legitimacy, build build trust, because that's what we're hearing from our customers. You know, uh, I think their employees are are getting okay at spotting their kind of generic phishing emails. They're, they're performing pretty well in their kind of simulation tests. But where employees are really struggling is where kind of legitimacy and trust is really built. And I imagine they're more expensive to send as an attacker, more care is put into them. But I'd just love to hear your thoughts around that. Yeah, what's, what's really interesting, let's, let's take a look at, at organized crime for a second and the different actors that we see from a, from a, a ransomware perspective. You know, if you go back 10 or 11 years ago, um, very unsophisticated type of operations, but they had a wide level of success and made a ton of money off of it. And as they continue to, to, to grow and to get more money, they increase their staffing, their research, their ability for tooling and weaponization. And over the past several years, they've grown from just going to individuals, to, you know, to small churches and things of that effect, to small to medium sized businesses. And now they're targeting larger organizations. You look at Garmin as an example where, you know, still undetermined, but it looks like Garmin paid, you know, either 10 to $15 million worth of ransom uh, to recover their systems. And so they're going after larger targets now and not with the commodity type of things that you would see before. These are these are highly specialized um, infiltration groups that focus on open source intelligence gathering of understanding your employees, their positions, technologies they list, um, you know, and understanding all that beforehand and then building and crafting pretexts or attacks uh, directly off of relevant information that would be used within your own environment. And those are the most difficult, right? You know, when you hear the term spear phishing, you know, when it's targeted against one to two to three individuals, that's where you have a very low ratio of detection because if, if one of those individuals does not report it, uh, you have a very difficult time actually responding to that versus the commodity ones that you see out there where they're targeting 50, 60, 100, 500,000 employees. You know, usually one person is going to report that saying, hey, this, this doesn't look right. So you know, it, it's becoming much more difficult to spot these types of, of, of targeted attacks. You know, they're highly effective because they're using personal information about an individual or about the organization, impersonating individuals within the organization, a, a marketing role, um, you know, an HR role, uh, you know, somebody in technology. We saw one recently where um, they're impersonating somebody from, from information technology uh, saying, hey, you know, since we're working from home, I need to remote into your system, you know, and had them do all this, the, the, these steps. Um, and was perfectly successful in, in getting full access to the computer. And then from there, moved laterally across the environment. We came in from an incident response perspective to, to help them out. So, you know, it, it's very difficult because, you know, it, to, to Jeff's point, not a lot of people know what is normal and what's not because, you know, we've, we've shifted to a work from home strategy perspective. So the new norm is, hey, somebody can call me up or somebody can email me from IT because we are work from home and they need to do some specific things on my computer or they're noticing unusual activity from my computer. And hey, I'm going to check this person really quick. Oh, it's an actual name that, that works in IT, you know, within our organization. They, they do their homework and they're getting substantially better at what they do. So, so the techniques are, are very driven off of individuals. And, and going down even, even a little bit further, the, the tactics that, that um, these attackers are using, the, the, the types of techniques, that the individual techniques themselves um, are getting more sophisticated. So instead of you know, using an executable or binary, they're leveraging either PowerShell exploitation or what we call living off the land, where they're actually executing legitimate applications in your system for, for code execution. So it's not just the, the phishing campaign components, it's also the weaponization and tooling, trying to evade your current detections that you have for your individual employees. And that's why it's, it's really important to have, you know, a layer of technical controls in place uh, to try to prevent that, especially from a work from home perspective. You know, Ed, you'd mentioned, uh, you know, you, you have your IT folks that are that are continuously saying, hey, you need to download this agent, you need to go and do this, you need to do that. Our, our work from home strategy needs to be very simplistic in how we manage our remote workforce from a baseline and configuration management perspective, um, as well as the education aspects that goes around teaching individuals like, hey, this is this is not something that we would do um, and showing real world examples of that. So, you know, the, the, the techniques have gotten substantially more sophisticated going after uh, small to medium sized businesses and larger organizations. And this should be a really big wake up call that if you look at the 10 year progression of, of these ransomware groups, they are not targeting small to medium sized businesses anymore. You know, large organizations are on notice right now uh, for these types of attacks. Uh, there was just one recently um, that was just released yesterday for Tesla, uh, where Tesla uh, 
Um, uh, there was a, a, a Russian uh, person that contacted another Russian employee inside of Tesla and offered him a million dollars to install software that was eventually going to be used for, for intellectual property theft and ransomware. And luckily, that, that individual employee, from an insider threat perspective, uh, notified Tesla and, and worked with the FBI and actually arrested the individual that was trying to pay a million dollars to the internal employee. But you know, you're looking at insider threat. I mean, that, that is one of the most difficult things to identify and, and detect within an organization. And you know, this is an in-person meeting talking Russian to another Russian employee at Tesla that was, that was specifically targeted at a location saying, I'll give you a million dollars, most likely from the Russian intelligence agency to get their intellectual property. You know, that, that's, that's some pretty sophisticated stuff that we're seeing out there today. That's a, uh, a, pretty, a pretty scary example, actually. And yeah, the kind of the threat uh, landscape is, is so varied. Um, and you've given some really good examples um, there of just how varied they can be. Just, I guess, handing back to, to Jeff to just hear his thoughts um, on the, I guess, the fact that targeted um, impersonation emails, the ones that are more highly crafted, sent to fewer people, seem to be more effective they seem to actually get the outcome for the attacker. Jeff, I'd love to hear, you know, why why is that? Why does legitimacy and trust play a part into the human psyche, whereas humans are maybe becoming quite good at clicking, you know, avoiding the click here to win a million dollars type phishing scam? Yeah, I think we use heuristics that we've evolved over uh, many, many millennia. So if somebody knows a lot of information about me, my friends, my network, the chances are that person is somebody that's going to be um, a friend rather than a foe. And so Dave's exactly right. With the plethora of information out there about us and our, our colleagues, we're seeing really, really specialized attacks that are trying to get after um, their sort of like high risk, high reward attacks. Uh, so recently we've been studying a case where it was unclear how they were getting information about this other person. And they were using Google Maps. So they were able to tell like what kind of car they had. They were able to understand sort of what their what their environment was like. So they were saying things like, oh yeah, no, I, I we were having trouble with the plumbing as well, were you? And there were just happened to be a plumbing van taped outside when uh, the Google um, uh, camera went by. And so this person was like, oh, obviously a neighbor, like who else would know that? And so we're seeing a lot of creativity in using these kinds of new um, knowledge sources. I think that um, to Dave's point too about education, uh, we can't think of security for our people as a destination. It, I think this is sort of a journey mindset where it's like, okay, this is just something we're going to be going on together. We're trying to achieve this as a company. And when you think of it as a journey, you're kind of constantly preparing. I love the Tesla example that Dave uh, mentioned. There wasn't any security there. There was nothing technical, but that guy believed in Tesla. And that's part of the culture. That's part of that mindset of Tesla's on a journey to achieve something big, right? And when, when I think employees believe in their company and they believe that they're going somewhere important, that security sort of like falls in because everybody wants to um, be the one that helps the company move forward or helps their group move forward. So I like the idea of education being uh, a journey rather than a destination. I think that is such a, a great way of, of looking at it. We have very similar messaging um, at, at, at Tessian. It's one of our core values, human first. Security doesn't need to be the scary thing. It's about building trust. It's about empowering people. It's about getting them to engage with security and not be afraid of it. Um, and I, I, I kind of love that kind of journey versus um, destination. We're, we're, we're maybe going to steal that off you, Jeff. Um, I think we are almost at time. Uh, but David, I would love if you could just share like one minute, you, just one thing you picked up on that I'm not sure that um, everyone on the call will be aware of. You mentioned how people do open source um, re recon to try and find their targets. What tools are people using? Uh, what can companies be doing to try and kind of limit that? Yeah, you know, the, the, the type of information that we reveal online um, are things that attackers can leverage to go after us, right? Um, going after executives that are there, their, their full profiles and bios, board members, all the way down to individual, uh, you know, roles and responsibilities. You know, tools like LinkedIn, uh, Salesforce, for example, Salesforce is probably one of the most effective open source intelligence gathering tools that we have out there because they, they share all that information as long as you pay for it and attackers pay for that type of information. It's, it's extremely valuable. So, you know, Focusing on, on an understanding 
what type of information you have out there, corporate policies that can hopefully limit that, like not being specific with individualized technologies, like, hey, we're using, you know, this EDR product or this, you know, mail gateway or this type of protection mechanism uh, to try to limit your foothold. But also, you know, going back to, to Jeff's point, I think, you know, education awareness is a continual piece. You have to focus on that in your users, especially as your baselines change uh, over time. And it's never going to be perfect. Humans will, will always error um, in every way, shape or form. It's, it's, it's making sure that if they do error or it's, it hits multiple people, that you have the ability to respond effectively uh, to minimize the damage towards the organization. And that's, that's a strategy that I, works I, for pretty much every aspect. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. Sorry to cut you off right at the end there. Yeah. Great, um, great takeaways, I think, for everybody listening. And thank you for sharing. Unfortunately, that is all that we've got time for uh, today. A huge thank you to Jeff and Dave for sharing their insights. Just one thing that this conversation has um, got me thinking about is just how, just the fact that email is inherently open uh, by design. And this just means that anybody, including attackers, if they are motivated enough, they will be able to send an email to you, to your family, to your employees, and it will be delivered. And I think that is a scary prospect in a kind of fully remote uh, world. Um, so it makes me think, what can we do? We've, we've talked today about training and awareness and empowerment. What can we do for our people there? And also what can technology do um, to help protect those very people? So thank you all for joining. And I'm going to hand back to you, Kelly.